Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest speaker, Karen Beth, Karen Buck Fallon, and all of the sheriffs that's up here are our constitutional sheriffs. All right, folks, let's get with it. Come on. We can't hear you. Karen Bud Fallon, she is from Cheyenne, Wyoming. She's our special guest, and we flew her in here special so you people could hear what this little lady has to say. It's my pleasure to introduce you to formally to the lady that's got a big voice and carries a big stick, Karen Bud Fallon. You want to go to Is this? Yes. All right. Can you hear? Yeah. Oh, they can hear me. I'm a mother. <laughs> I have two teenage kids and two extra kids. You can definitely hear me. And I think when he introduced me, he kind of forgot a few details about me that I'm going to help fill you all in on. Probably the most important thing you should know about me is that I am a mom. I have two marvelous teenage children, a husband I've been married to for 20 years. I've never wanted to divorce him. There are days I wanted to kill him. We have a couple of extra boys living with us, and one of my boys is going into the military. And I am very proud of that young man.
celebration. You know, today is Earth Day, and I think they're planting trees somewhere, and uh, you know, who knows what they're doing in, in some of the other places. But you know what I really thought about as I, as I thought about the speech is that people like my dad, who grew up on a cattle ranch, people who are loggers and miners, people who work with the land, are the only ones that should be allowed to celebrate Earth Day. Because we understand what's in this Earth and what the Earth is about. And we understand that we don't worship the Earth but that we are to take care of it and pass it on to our kids. Amen. And I'm not sure how the Lord got that to I think I told the story the last time I spoke to some of you, but I'm going to tell it again because it, A, it's true, and B, it has such a profound effect, effect on me growing up. As I grew up about 150 miles south of, of Yellowstone Park in the Geysers, and when I was in either junior high or high school, I remember there was this big fuss because Old Faithful wasn't going off at exactly the same time on the hour. And so all these scientists are trying to figure out why in the heck is Old Faithful not going off to the minute every single time. And so they had a big meeting in Pinedale, which is the other town in our county, because my dad said more dead people voted in Pinedale than voted in Big Piney, which is why Pinedale's the county seat. So we all voted the county seat, and we're sitting in the little courthouse, and, and the kids all got to sit in the jury box, which we all thought was pretty cool. And these guys from the federal government are telling us that they think what's affecting the geysers is too much livestock grazing on the national forest 150 miles south of the park. And that's our grazing a lot. And I can remember listening to that and thinking, are you kidding me? How could livestock grazing grass 150 miles south of Yellowstone Park be affecting the geysers? And these guys were really upset and that we had to cut cattle numbers and we had to do all these different things because they didn't want those cows grazing out there. And my dad, I mean, after my dad calmed down from being as mad as I have ever seen him, you could see, though, a little bit he's thinking, you know, is there something true or are we doing something wrong? But, you, but think about it. If we were as bad as those guys said, we'd have put ourselves out of business four generations ago. We only ended up at Big Piney because we got snowed in there in the 1800s and nobody ever left. We've been grazing cattle on that same land ever since. And it's been a good living for our family. And it's been a good way to take care of that county. And I'm telling you, if we were overgrazing, if we were ruining the land, if we were killing all the wildlife, we wouldn't be there this many generations. And my nephew wouldn't be set to take over the ranch after he finishes college. So don't let him tell you that you're not a part of Earth Day. You guys are Earth Day every day. <coughs> Another thing that sort of made me think about is that, you know, Earth Day is really just good marketing. You know, Al Gore picked it and he sort of picked up on it and it's great marketing. But here's another marketing story. This is also a true story. After Hurricane Katrina came out, the Obama administration was really worried about how, you know, the federal government doesn't sound very good, and bureaucracy's not that great of a word. So this is truly hires a marketing firm to rebrand bureaucracy, and so they decided to call it the federal family. <laughs> and so there's this newspaper article in the, in the, the newspaper in Cheyenne, Wyoming, about the federal family. And my son and I are just, or my husband and I are standing in our kitchen just laughing about, you know, the federal family. Can you imagine? That's who's taking care of us now. I was talking to Dowlings about this. I got to stay at their house last night in Scott Valley. And they reminded me that it's sort of like Hillary Clinton's It Takes the Village. 
Only what they're thinking about is it takes the government to raise your children. Well, this is the federal family, and the federal family now is going to take care of all of us, and so we're laughing and giggling about this. And my son walks in and he says, this is the most dysfunctional family I have ever heard of. <laughs>
the Fish and Wildlife Service or you sue the BLM because the BLM isn't doing monitoring on your allotment or the environmental group sues the BLM, that money comes out of their budget. EJA statutorily caps the amount of money to be paid to attorneys at $125 an hour. Now they have increased that for inflation, which is why veterans attorneys get $200 and Social Security attorneys get $300. But these environmental groups have been able to convince this administration that because they're representing a special class of voiceless victims, you know, like rocks and trees and worms and stuff, and because environmental law is of such a specialty that they should get paid $775 an hour. Another problem with these funds is that the Equal Access to Justice Act does not apply to you if your net worth is over $7 million. And so, if you are a for-profit business, like you have a ranch, and you have land, and you have cattle, and you have equipment, there's a fairly decent chance that you may be worth over $7 million. You have no cash. Ranchers never have cash. But they've got an asset that's worth money. They can't get reimbursed for attorney's fees. But if you're quoting non-profit public interest group, it doesn't matter what your worth is, you can get reimbursed. And so the Sierra Club, whose net worth is $56 million, gets attorney's fees at $775 an hour when they sue the federal government. Now, I don't know whose public they're interested in, but it's not mine. Since 1995, there has been no accounting of any of this money. If you go to the federal government and you say, how much money have you paid out in total for a number of cases, they cannot tell you. They have no idea. And so the this Republican House member from Oregon has been holding hearings in Washington, D.C. to try to force the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to disclose how many times they're sued and how much money they've paid, and they will not answer that question. The truth is, I don't think they want the public to know. I don't think they want you to know how much money we're spending on bugs and rocks and fish and moss. And if you look at veterans cases and social security cases, those cases are holding steady. There's not, we're not seeing these big spikes in litigation to protect veterans or to protect social security beneficiaries. We're seeing huge spikes in environmental litigation. In fact, just looking at the numbers, there have been twice as many cases filed in the last two years of the Obama administration than there were in the last two years of the Bush administration. Twice the number. That's a lot of money at $775 an hour. And a lot of people will think, why? You know, why is the entire environmental group suing over things like bugs and moths and all this stuff? And I think I finally figured out the answer. The Center for Biological Diversity has just required the Fish and Wildlife Service to list the giant palouse earth-spitting worm as an endangered species. <laughs> so I had to look up the giant palouse earth spinning worm because I can't imagine that anybody but a fisherman would care about this worm. 
And I've learned all sorts of interesting things. The giant Palouse earth spinning worm is longer than a normal earthworm. That's kind of opaque. Not round like normal worms. The giant Palouse earth spinning worm lives in what they call the Palouse area, which is in western Washington and Idaho, where they, it's all private land and they do farming. It is the weirdest farming you've ever seen. It's really steep hills. And what they do is they have these big cement columns on the top of the hill, and they grow lots of grain there, lots of bread grains, and they take their combines, and because these hills are so steep, they chain the combine to the top of the hill, and then they drive the combine round and round and round to the bottom, and the head on the combine just tips with the steepness of the hill. So I gotta tell you, there's no chance I'm gonna get on a combine chained to the top of the hill. Because if they undo the chain, the cock the cock might tip over. But I went up there and see it, and these guys have had this land for generations, and they grow lots of grain there, and they fed their families on these family farms for generations, but now they've got the giant Palouse earth spitting worm living under their farms. According to the scientific literature, the giant Palouse earth spitting worm spits dirt at its enemies. So I'm laughing at this, and my, my daughter is there, and she's like, what's so funny? And I said, well, there's a worm that spits dirt at its enemy. Who could be a worm's enemy? And she says, fish, mother. <laughs> OK? Here's the other thing. Just so you know, if you ever see it, the giant Palouse earth spitting worm smells like lilies. So if you, if you ever run across a worm, and it spits at you, and it smells like lilies, it's in danger. But here's the sad part. Because the giant Palouse earth spinning worm is now on the threatened or endangered species list, there's a question about whether these farmers can plow up their land to plant their grain. Because if your plow hits a worm, it's a take. I'm telling you, we have gone off the deep end. And it's not about the worm. I don't think the Center for Biological Diversity cares two hoots about a worm that spits at you and smells like a flower. What they care about is getting those farmers off of their land. Peace. 
And you know what they're buying? Huge coffee uh, farms in Brazil. And they're buying, they're buying places, land in Madagascar. And in countries where people are starving, but they're taking land out of production to protect a species that that country doesn't have a list to protect, but we do. Now you explain to me, how in the heck did we decide that we needed to protect a species in countries that don't even like us? I mean, I think it's dumb enough we buy oil from people who don't like us, but don't you think this is a little kind of far?
13 cases dealing with 113 species where the petitions were missed. The Department of Justice settled, but they didn't just settle with the species involved in the litigation, the 113. No, they decided to be more generous. They settled and agreed to list and designate critical habitat for 1,053 species in the next five years. We did a survey. Those species are found in every single state in the nation. I couldn't believe that there was enough room in Rhode Island to have endangered species, but I guess there are. So in the next five years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to consider the petitions for 1,053 species. 940 were not even part of the litigation. And the total cost of just the paperwork, I'm not talking about like saving anything or planting trees or, you know, protecting habitat. I'm talking about processing paperwork for 1,053 species, $206,098,920 of your tax money. <coughs> Attorneys who work for Social Security beneficiaries will still get paid. 
pay what they pay now. So that they can help people who really need help. But we got to stop funneling money into groups that don't even believe in this country. And that's what I think environmental groups do. Now let me close by telling you a little bit about the Constitution. I actually learned some of the, most of this stuff from my dad. I think you'll be kind of disappointed to know that even though an attorney spends three years in law school trying to get educated about the law, we're not required to read the Constitution from front to back. You only read the Constitution if you've got a really cranky father who makes you, or you decide to do it on your own. But in reading the Constitution, I actually have learned some very, very interesting things. I think one of the things that the Constitution does that we have forgotten over the last 200 years is how it places the citizens vis-a-vis -vis the government. I gotta tell you right now, I think that the federal government thinks it's on top and the citizens are on the bottom and that we were put here to serve them. And I have to tell you, that's not what the Constitution says.
He wrote the first dictionary so you wouldn't change the meaning of the words in the Constitution. He knew how important that document was. Because that document is the foundation of this country. And if we don't have a strong foundation in this country, this country is going to crumble. And we have to build that foundation. I'll bet every one of you is driven by an old ranch house and you look at it and you see the bottom and it's all crumbly and falling because somebody isn't taking care of it. Folks, I'm really worried that because we are not taking care of our Constitution, we are not understanding that document, we are not enforcing our guaranteed rights that our, that our country is going to look like some of those old crumbly ranch houses that we've all passed. We have to shore up the foundation of this country, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have a choice. And when you look at the Federalist Papers, which are the papers that Madison and those guys wrote to try to convince people that they should agree to the Constitution, you know what they thought was the most important thing? The ownership of property. Now, a lot of people got mad last time I talked to you and they said, well, she must only talk, be talking about land. Property is not defined by the federal constitution. And the Supreme Court has said that over and over. Property is defined by usage and customs in the local area. Which is why miners have a property interest in those claims that were created back in 1866 and in 1891 under those acts. Amen. It's why a water right has been determined as a property right. It is why intellectual property is protected and patented and copyrighted. That's private property. So if somebody creates a painting, somebody writes a play, somebody produces a film, that's just as much private property as my ranch in Big Piney, Wyoming. And that is the basis for every other freedom that we have. That's why the framers put in the Constitution the right to bear arms so that we could protect our property. That's why they guaranteed the right to worship, freedom of the press, freedom of the speeches, so we could protect and stand on our property. No matter what that private property is. And we have to do that now.
One of the few places I feel absolutely safe. This is really cool. I thank you for inviting me, and God bless America.